o'clock, so let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to the Welcome Spring Author Speaker Series. I'm Denise Ellsworth with Ohio State University Department of Entomology and OSU Extension. And along with my co-host, Julia Wilson, who's at Chadwick Arboretum, um, and our facilitator, Marsha Karsten, I wanna welcome you to the last day of our uh, week of, of 10 o'clock webinars um, here on Zoom. Uh, Julie's going to give us a hello in just a minute from Chadwick, uh, but I wanted to uh, recognize and thank Marsha Karsten, who is uh, Xerces ambassador and also an OSU volunteer pollinator specialist, has been a great help with all of these webinars, um, helping with tech questions and um, to keep things running smoothly. So Marsha, thanks so much for, uh, for your help this week. You know, I think for all of this has been a, a really challenging year, um, and we've dealt with some some losses of some sort, right? Small losses or many of us big losses. We've lost friends or, or family. And um, so we wanted to plan when Julie and I were looking back in the fall, what do we want to do to kind of come together and, and offer some educational workshops this winter? And uh, we just love the idea of, of planning something right after we turned um, the calendar to spring. Um, when there's more light outside, things are warming up and there's um, you know a little bit of optimism and hope in the air. And so I hope you've enjoyed this webinar series. I know I have learned so much from our amazing presenters this week. I can't wait to go back and um, look at all the webinars again, listen to them. Sometimes I'll take my phone and just uh, my um, AirPods and listen while I'm walking to, um, to learn what I, uh, you know, what I missed the first time. So just as a reminder, we do have a, um, a web page for the whole series. It's that Go address that's on your screen, go.osu.edu slash spring authors. And so far, the tech gods have been working with me. They're smiling. Um, I have four out of five of our webinars linked up there. And so, uh, and I'm adding in then other things the authors have asked, you know, publications or, uh, uh, you know, resources, papers, that kind of thing. So I'll continue to add those onto that page. And um, I have been able to upload those webinar recordings to YouTube. So they'll really stay there kind of indefinitely. So if you want to share those with others, or, you know, sometimes folks like to use these for um, their garden club or, or their Audubon meetings, since we can't do so much in person right now, um, you're more than welcome to do that. I'm happy to have all the, the, those great webinars shared um, far and wide with other people. So uh, Julia, can you uh, give us a hello from, um, from Chadwick? I love your backdrop today. Tell us what's going on down there in Columbus. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Hello from Chadwick Arboretum. It's our last day for the author speaker series, and it's been a really great way to spend my morning together, and I hope you all feel the same way. So on our last day together, I'm going to take you through our final garden site here at the Arboretum called the Learning Gardens. These gardens are located just outside of the student hall where the Chadwick office sits called Howlett Hall. So you can kind of see it behind me and Denise, you can change, oh, you got it. Yes, you can kind of see it behind me and in these top two uh, photos behind all of the plants, that's Howlett Hall. So starting with the top left photo, here we have the Stephen Still Garden. This garden is an assortment of native and cultivated plants and was designed by Adrian Bloom, a famous English plantsman. The key features in this design are two rivers of plants. One goes diagonal of blue wild geranium and the other diagonal is Japanese bloodgrass. And that's what you can see there in that photo. The top right photo is of our Kleinmeyer garden, which I thought you all would enjoy. It has a mixture of native plants and cultivated plants, um, but we are in the process of replanting with all native plants and designating it as a certified wildlife habitat through National Wildlife Federation. So if you come to the bottom right hand side photo, that's the Van Fossen Wildflower Garden and it's a collection of ephemeral native wildflowers like wild ginger and trillium and it's gonna be waking up soon. And finally, when you come through the doors of Howlett Hall and out the back, you come right onto our 12,000 square foot green roof which provides a great view of the greenhouses and campus beyond. Um, just a quick word to those of you living in Columbus and surrounding area, Chadwick Arboretum usually hosts two plant sales this time of year. 
our cool season plant sale and our spring plant sale fundraiser. The cool season plant sale did have to be canceled this year, but you can go to Des Moines Greenhouse in Columbus um, to receive 25% off of your cool season flowers this weekend if you mention Chadwick Arboretum at the registrar, register, but that's only this weekend. And just a little heads up that we will hopefully be holding a mini version of our spring plant sale on May 13th through 15th. So keep an eye out on our website for an official announcement. We're really hoping to be able to hold that this year in person. So Denise and I were saying last night that we don't know what we're going to be doing with ourselves on Saturday at 10 a.m. <laughs> we're going to miss you all. But a huge thanks to all of you for attending the series and watching the recordings. This has been an incredible learning opportunity for me. So thank you, Denise and Marsha for having me. And I hope we can all do this again soon. Great, thanks, Julia. I really appreciate that. So I forgot to mention our funders, so let me take just a minute to do that. We received some uh, funding from the USDA for an integrated pest management grant focusing on pollinator health, and so those funds help support this webinar series. And then we also have funding from the Manitou Fund toward our pollinator outreach activities, so thanks to, um, to both of those funders. So I'm thrilled to have Mary Gardner with us. Um, she is a professor here in the Department of Entomology at OSU. And in my tenure here at OSU, she has done so many community science projects and really interesting research projects. Um, she has a really well-rounded program. All of our faculty need to blend uh, their academic teaching, their research, and their extension and outreach. And Mary, I don't know how she takes the load that she has. Um, so she's teaching extension programs. She has community science efforts like uh, the, the Buckeye Lady Beetle Blitz, which was an ongoing program for years that taught folks about um, ladybird beetles, uh, well, lady beetles and others um, out there in their landscapes. Um, she now coordinates the uh, Dandelion Detective student program, youth program, um, to help kids observe uh, flowers and uh, pollinators. And then you may have heard of her urban project in Cleveland, a five-year project uh, with um, outreach into vacant properties in Cleveland, um, looking at different planting schemes and studying the biodiversity in urban Cleveland. So um, some really fascinating projects. And also, of course, this wonderful book, Good Garden Bugs, um, and just wanted to open to one page that really highlights all the different um, um, lady beetles out uh, in our landscape, some of those beneficial insects. So uh, Mary, so happy to have you here this morning. I'm gonna turn the, um, the screen over to you and um, can't wait to, um, to learn all about these great predatory insects out in the landscape. Thank you, Denise and Julia uh, and Marsha for inviting me and organizing an incredible group of speakers. I have some very tough acts to follow. So I hope that those of you who said what a wonderful series this ha uh, has been will enjoy this program uh, today. So uh, I am a professor in the entomology department here at OSU. And I think one of the small positives that we can glean from what has been a really challenging year is the opportunity to, to provide our information to those of you further away. So. I don't normally get to give programs to, to um, you know, more than countrywide groups at one time. So this is really exciting for me and I really appreciate all of you being here today. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and try to share my screen. Okay. So uh, Denise, can you just confirm that um, you can see the title slide? I can see it. Okay, yeah. great. I just wanted to make sure before we get started. So I will be talking today about good garden bugs, everything you need to know about predatory insects. And this is a topic that I've been studying uh, since I was a master's student uh, and something that most of my research focuses on today. So I'm really pleased to be able to um, discuss this with you. So I wanted to first start by giving just a couple of slides about my background and what I do uh, here at Ohio State. So I am a professor of entomology. I'm also our graduate studies chair. So uh, I do all the admissions and, and help with recruiting of graduate students into our program. 
The majority of my job focuses on research. So 85% of my job uh, is research activities. And as Denise mentioned, a lot of that work focuses on the ecology of urban green spaces. I have a large research program in Cleveland uh, that we've done for years. And I'm now working in the cities of Cleveland Heights and East Cleveland with some community organizations on gardening research uh, in those cities. We examine vacant land for conservation of insects. And these pictures show some of our wildflower plantings on vacant lots. We also work with homeowners to design home landscaping for beneficial insects. And as Denise mentioned, uh, I also have a focus on the decline of ladybugs in the landscape and why that might be and have had um, community science assistance with that program for years. And actually, if you are an Ohio Master Gardener and want to hear um, about the findings of that program, I am giving a program on April 15th. Uh, to the Ohio Master Gardeners. And so there should have been um, or will be shortly announcements about that um, through your Ohio Master Gardener email listserv. So because I have a large research appointment, I get to work with a lot of really great people in my program. This is my current lab. You can see we've gone ahead and done our Zoom picture. I think everyone's getting these this year. Um, these are all my students and postdocs. So uh, Carly and Michelle just started this year. Sarah Scott, some of you know from her programs on bee ecology. She's a PhD student. Uh, Kayla Perry is a postdoc uh, in the group. Uh, Denisha Parker and Katie Turo are PhD students who are going to graduate in a couple weeks. And Lydia Fai is a mid-career PhD student who studies mosquitoes in cities. In addition to my research, I do a lot of extension work, such as this presentation. I work with master gardener groups, and as Denise mentioned, 4-H and also citizen science. So some of the things we've done recently, our lab um, has published a new series of insect 4-H curriculum books. And so if you're looking for something for youth to do this summer, there is a beginner, intermediate, and advanced book available on the 4-H website. Uh, we also are going to do our dandelion detective summer program again for kids to collect data in their own backyard. Um, and I said, I've done this ladybug survey and of course, um, the book that I'm gonna talk to you about today. I also get to teach. Uh, right now I'm teaching presentation skills. So hopefully this isn't a terrible presentation because I'm supposedly uh, supposed to be aware of good presentation skills. I also teach grant writing. This is my grant writing class. We do a lot of peer workshopping and I help the students put proposals into a, a fund that Ohio State has where they can compete for research funding. And then I also teach insect ecology with a colleague in our department. So that's kind of what I do. I, I love my job. I feel really fortunate to be able to um, study and help protect insects um, through my teaching extension and research. And so uh, today I'm gonna to be sharing with you sort of what to do in your own backyard to conserve these beneficial insects. And some of our previous speakers have uh, talked about specific groups of insects. I'm gonna take a broader approach and kind of focus on all of the beneficial um, predators and parasitoids that we find, sort of the creepier insects that you may not be sure you want to conserve until you might know some of their benefits. So I want to start by just kind of placing these insects in a wider group of insects to provide us with benefits as people in, in our landscape. So insects provide a lot of beneficial ecological services. They are pollinators. So here we have bees and flies visiting flowers. They provide pest suppression or biological control. And these are the insects I'm gonna focus on today. So here we have a parasitoid wasp and a lady beetle eating aphids. They're also critical um, food sources for wildlife. And of course, they're beautiful, diverse, unique, and add to our overall biodiversity of our planet. And so there's just millions and millions and millions of insects and um, important to conserve in their own right. And so today uh, I'm going to be focusing on identifying natural enemies and how to conserve them in your landscape. Sorry, I'm gonna try to move this over a little bit because I've set myself up where my screen with me is in the way of my screen with the presentation and it is making that very challenging. Okay. So we are gonna focus first on insects that are predatory. 
So predator insects are those that hunt for their own prey. And the majority of these are generalist predators, meaning they will eat lots of different insect pests and other insects in the landscape. And they have some really interesting and unique hunting strategies. And I'll be going through and talking about some of those. So for instance, you know, here we have in this first picture, a mantis that's going to have a sit and wait hunting strategy that relies heavily on visual cues. Whereas this next insect is a fly midge that is eyeless and relies on vibrational cues. So the types of features that these insects use to find their prey are really different and unique too. So I'm going to first take you on a tour through some of the diversity of predators and parasitoids that you can find. And these are going to be pretty broad categories. And so they're gonna be insects that you can find in most parts um, of the, the uh, US and Canada, which it looked like most of our participants are uh, joining us from. If anyone has any particular questions, uh, certainly you can ask that uh, too for your own area. So I'm gonna start off with mantids. So most people are familiar and enjoy finding mantids in their yard. Uh, mantids are generalist predators. They do eat a number of different insects, both pest insects and also beneficial, other beneficial insects that they might capture. Um, as I said, they have this sit and wait hunting strategy. So they have very good visual, um, they have very good vision and they also have raptorial front legs. And so they will sit and wait very quietly um, without really moving. They're very hard to spot. And then when something comes in their grasp, they will grab onto it. And you, they can take pretty large prey. In this picture here, you can see a mantid eating a grasshopper. Um, and here's one eating a beetle or, or some sort of large insect. Uh, what many people don't realize is actually two of the most common mantids that we have in the US are introduced species. So this is the European mantid in this large picture and also in this insert with the grasshopper. The European mantid was introduced into the United States from Europe uh, in the, um, early 1900s. Uh, you can tell it's the European mantid by this eye spot it has on the inside of its raptorial front legs. So this white spot here. The other very common mantid is also an alien species. This is the Chinese mantid. Uh, it's a little bit larger than the European mantid. It can be green or brown in color, but it always has this bright green stripe. Um, we do have one um, native mantid here in Ohio and a couple in the U.S. Uh, overall. And here in the Midwestern and uh, region and also in the Southeastern U.S., you can find the Carolina mantid. And you can see here that this insect looks a little bit different from the others in that its wing covers don't completely cover the abdomen in the female. And also it has this black spot on its wing covers. And so if you see this black spot, you can distinguish the Carolina from the Chinese or European mantid. But all of these mantids are generalists and all of them will consume um, different prey within the environment. So they all share that same feeding strategy, although they're different species. Now our second group of insects have a different feeding strategy and this is the true bugs. So instead of grabbing something and chewing it apart, like you saw the mantid eating that grasshopper, True bugs have a piercing sucking beak and they will use that beak to inject a venom into their prey. And then they will, the, the paralytic enzymes in their venom will break down the liquid, the, the internal contents of the insect prey, uh, allowing the insect to um, ingest a liquid diet. And so it's almost like a straw, this um, beak. So you can see here uh, on this drawing really clearly what that looks like. And then here is a real life um, true bug with its beak. And you can see that this true bug is being held and it is not happy about it. And it is trying to bite the thumb of this person very aggressively. You can see by the look in its eyes, just not pleased about its current situation. Um, these will bite sometimes if, if handled, some of the larger ones. Uh, and so that is something to be uh, aware of before you go to pick them up. And I'll point out some of the ones I would not pick up, but they are very cool and very effective biological control agents of many important garden pests. So here are some of our, our common garden predators that are true bugs. One that really often goes unnoticed, but is a real workhorse is the minute pirate bug. This is known to consume large quantities of aphid pests and small uh, caterpillars and eggs. 
thrips, things like that, that can be really um, a pain in the garden. The minute pirate bug is um, very small, less than an eighth of an inch in length. You can see it has this checkerboard board wing pattern on the adult and it sort of has a wedge shaped uh, look to it. This is its uh, immature nymph stage and it looks a little bit like a little mite. These are often found um, in flowers. They also feed on pollen and nectar when they're not searching for prey but because of their size, uh, they tend to go unnoticed. So be on the lookout for these when you're out in the garden. Slightly larger is the damsel bug. The damsel bug is also an aphid predator, although it will eat many other different types of soft bodied small insects. The damsel bug is about a quarter of an inch long. It has um, a mottled brown coloration. You can see here this big beak, it's feeding on some nectar right now but the raptorial front legs tell you that this insect can also eat a number of different prey. Now this other uh, insect here is also a true bug. It's a two spotted stink bug. And I put this in because with the brown marmorated stink bug that's present in many parts of the US and Canada, many people have begun to associate all stink bugs as pests, but there are actually many species of predatory stink bugs. They don't necessarily eat other stink bugs, but they prey on other kinds of insects. This particular one eats Colorado potato beetle, uh, eggs and larvae, among other things. But I really often find it on potato plants when there's Colorado potato beetle present. And so if you find this, it can have orange or even dark sort of reddish bright uh, patterns on its body as shown in the picture. Um, you do not have two potato pests. You have Colorado potato beetle and something eating your Colorado potato beetle. Keeping with the true bugs, I wanted to show some of the creepier and cool larger ones that we can find. Um, some, uh, these are the assassin bugs, and this is a large and diverse group of insects within the true bugs. They're called the Regiviidae, is the family. And here we have an assassin bug. I absolutely love this picture. I used it in my book. It's an assassin bug waiting on a flower. And in those things in the front are its large raptorial front legs. So many of these are also a sit and wait hunter. This insect uh, on the bottom panel is called the wheel bug. These are very common um, throughout the US. They're very large. This is more than an inch in total length. And it's called the wheel bug because of this um, set of spines it has on its thorax. You can really see the um, raptorial beak here in the front. Uh, the wheel bug is one that you do not want to um, pick up because it will bite uh, people if hand mishandled but it is a very effective predator. Now, these other two pictures are actually of the same insect. It's called the masked hunter. You can see also that this is a very large insect, about an inch long. What it's eating here is an earwig. Many people know the size of an earwig. So here we have an insect quite a bit bigger than an earwig. I guess I shouldn't go like this. I'm like making it seem like the thing is like a foot long. It's not that big, but it is pretty large. Uh, the masked hunter is an introduced species. Uh, it's a European species that was introduced into the US. But I put it in here because, well, two reasons. One time my mom called me and she said that she had a big insect in her house and it hissed at her. I was like, you're insane. It didn't hiss at you. And she sent me a picture of one of these and I looked it up and they actually can um, take in air and use their wings to make a hissing sound. So I was wrong there. So it can hiss at you. And the other thing that's kind of neat is they're called the masked hunter because the immature stage covers itself in dirt and debris and as a means to hide from would-be predators. And you can see in this top picture, that is actually the immature stage of the insect covered in sand and debris. And these do tend to kind of come in the house uh, more than other types of assassin bugs. And so you may find one and just um, can collect and put outside. All right, so we're going to leave the true bugs and keep moving on through the insect world with the lace wings and other net veined predators. Lace wings are beautiful insects and there's many different species, but uh, the green lace wings all share a pretty common adult form. And this is the adult form here in this big picture. They have large eyes, slender, bright green bodies and beautiful lace-like net veined wings and long antennae. 
Some lacewing adults are predators of insect pests, but others feed on pollen and nectar only, or they might not even feed at all. Uh, they might be very short lived, but all of their offspring, their immature stages will feed on insect prey. This is a lacewing larva, and you can see it's consuming an aphid here. It has these big jaws. Sometimes these are called aphid alligators. And so the adult will go around and it lays these uh, eggs on little stalks, and these stalked eggs will hatch into these larvae. Now, depending on the species of lacewing, some of the larvae look like this, where they are um, what's called naked. And there are also some that are called debris carrying. In the debris carrying species, the actual larvae looks just like this one here. Um, but you can see here in this picture that the entire insect is covered with debris. And this is another um, camouflage strategy. And so as this thing eats insects, it's piling the carcasses on top of itself along with plant material and leaf material and debris and things. And so this big ball of stuff uh, is concealing this larva underneath, which I just think is so neat. These insects might look somewhat familiar uh, if you have kids that have ever played with antlions. Uh, lacewings are related to antlions, and so I wanted to throw these in here so not everyone's residential landscape will be suitable for antlions, but if you were to dig up the larvae, you would find that the larvae look very similar to lacewing larvae. And now that you've seen the lacewing adult and take a look at the antlion adult, you can see that they also have some similar features, like the long body, the very intricately veined wings, and the big eyes. And these are also the little antlion pits. So lacewings uh, larvae feed on plants. They, they do not make pits like this. Another important group to look for in your residential landscape are predatory beetles. And I could have put a lot of different families. Uh, the beetles are one of the most diverse groups of insects out there. But I'm going to focus on two major groups that you're very likely to find that are known to be very important predators of pest insects. And the first of those are the ground beetles. This is a very diverse order. If you have a PhD in entomology and are a researcher, at some point in your career, you've probably studied ground beetles, like almost everyone. I've done projects with ground beetles, and it's because they're very numerous, they're beautiful, and they're very important, and they're also ecological indicators. And so if you do any sort of ecology work, you've probably studied these at some point. Uh, ground beetles are, are huge uh, family of insects, but they all kind of share some major features, at least the common ones that you'd be likely to see in a residential landscape. Many of them are black in color and shiny like this one, or metallic like this one, and they often have these striations or indentations on their wings. And when I tend to find these, if I go out early in the morning to water, if I look at areas of bare ground in my garden, I'll sometimes catch, you know, a shimmer from one or see something running and they will be running along the ground, especially early before it gets hot. You can find them. Or if you're out weeding or moving mulch, sometimes you'll uncover them because they are in and around the soil surface. Their larva looks um, a little bit similar to the adult and that it's also shiny and black or metallic. It has these series of plates. The larvae are usually found um, in the mulch or uh, topsoil. So they'll go down underground a bit too looking for prey. These guys eat a diversity of different kinds of pests, mostly things like cutworms or things along the, the soil surface. Some species specialize in snails and slugs. Um, so here is uh, one eating a snail, this larva. But there are species, even though they're called ground beetles, that climb trees. There are species that hunt um, gypsy moths and other tree pests as well. So these are extremely beneficial beetles. They vary in size from the size of a sesame seed to bigger than a pumpkin seed. So these things can be really big um, and colorful. Here's one with pink spots and you can see some beautiful big metallic beetles here. My favorite group are the lady beetles. Um, I've studied lady beetles for many years. Lady beetles, people think of as red with black spots, but there's actually many, many, many species around the world of coccinellidae or lady beetle species. Uh, in the United States, we have both alien introduced and native species. One of our most common is the multicolored Asian ladybug. Here in this picture, you can see its larva, which looks like a little alligator, and the adult beetle. 
This is a beetle introduced from China, but it's become very abundant in the United States now. This is another picture of the same insect. You can see that um, this one doesn't have spots. So it's called the multicolored Asian lady beetle because sometimes it has spots, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's almost tan, sometimes it's dark red. So there's a lot of variation in what this one looks like. Whereas most species, you see one, they all sort of look the same. Um, so that's one unique feature about that insect. But uh, not all ladybugs look like the multicolored Asian ladybugs. So I wanted to point out some variation. This is the twice stabbed ladybug. So this is a black ladybug with red spots. This is a scale eating species that you're likely to find in trees. So I had a major scale problem a few years ago on one of my trees and I would find these all the time. This is the polished ladybug. This is an aphid eater. It's smaller than the multicolored Asian ladybug. And it uh, also is found in, in gardens eating aphids. This is the pink ladybug. This one feeds on corn pollen, corn pests, and other uh, pests in, in uh, vegetable gardens, especially. It's found in a lot of habitats, but you're most likely to find it uh, providing benefit in a vegetable garden. And then this is just a bigger picture of the larvae. Uh, both the adult and larvae will feed on aphids. And this little insert is its life cycle. So if you find orange uh, eggs in little groupings like this, that's ladybug eggs. They hatch into the alligator like larvae. The pupae kind of looks like a strange hybrid of the larvae and the adult. Um, so it's kind of a scrunched up adult and it will be attached to plants. And then of course, there are many species of adults to look for. All right, so in addition to beetles, which some people do recognize as, as being beneficial, we're next going to move into flies, which really get no love from most people, but there are some very beneficial flies in the garden. Uh, and one of the, my favorite groups are the surfid flies. And this is the surfid flies. So um, some of their mimics, first of all, and many of them, and you can see that some of them are like bumblebee mimics that are kind of furry. Some of them are wasp mimics. The adults are actually pollinators. They visit flowers and consume pollen and nectar. And in that process, move some around to other plants. They also, the females will lay their eggs within um, areas where there are aphids. These larvae will eat aphids. And you can see here, um, this slug-like larva has some little dead things stuck to it. Those are aphids that are shriveled up. So these will um, kind of rasp at the aphid and ingest the liquid content. And so if you see these slugs within patches of aphids, again, you don't have two pests, you have something eating the aphid. There are many predatory flies uh, out there. Another cool group are the robber flies. So here's a big robber fly that's a bumblebee mimic. This is a long-legged robber fly that's more of a wasp mimic. Uh, these will catch insects in the air. Uh, so they're very, very good flyers. Uh, some can be very big, larger than an inch. Many are more like a quarter inch type size, but they're really, really beautiful and fun to look for in the garden and very fun to watch because they're such strong flyer. One that's a little harder to spot is this predatory midge. You're unlikely to find the adult because it kind of looks like any small like gnat or midge-like insect, but the larvae are a sort of hot pink, uh, bright orange color. And like the surfids, these are eating aphids. And so here is a patch of aphids with these predatory midge larvae. They're just a little bit smaller than the surfids. They're kind of just a little bit bigger than the aphids. I threw in the picture of the adult just because they have a cool backstory. The adults mate in spider webs. And this is a female hanging from a spider web thread. And the females emit a pheromone and attract a mate. And I reared these once in cages and we had to put little strings in there to get them to reproduce. And they did all line up on the strings just like they were in spider webs. It was really cool. All right, so in addition to flies, there are many predatory wasps. <clears throat> many of these are solitary. So people think wasps, we think paper nest, something's going to attack me, um, you know, murder hornets, 2020, everything's crazy. But actually there are many wasps that are perfectly safe to be around. They're not going to attack you, they're docile. They're just going about their business, raising their young. So I wanted to point out a diversity of these. Um, many of these things will construct a nest and then provision it with insect prey. 
One example is a mud dauber. So it makes this mud nest above ground. And you can see here the female has mud and she's making this nest. She will then uh, collect and kill insects and stuff them in the nest, lay her eggs in there, and her larvae will eat those insects and then emerge as adults after they've pupated. Similar concept with the spider wasp. Now, obviously, spiders are also beneficial. So this wasp isn't necessarily providing a pest control by eating the spiders, but it's really a neat ecological phenomenon. And people often will find this happening where a wasp is dragging a spider and wondering what's going on. So this female has parasitized this or paralyzed this spider and the paralyzed spider will be drugged down into this hole and then she will lay an egg on it and her larvae will eat the paralyzed spider. So it's quite a gruesome situation for the spider, but um, then the larvae will pupate and come out as another big spider wasp. Similar thing here with this cutworm wasp. So cutworms are major pest for many of us and this wasp will do that same behavior, but it collects cutworms. And you can see these things have to drag these big cutworms. So it is very interesting to watch these females pull these cutworms down into their nest. This is a flower wasp and pretty soon we'll be able to start seeing these out. Uh, these eat grubs. So you sometimes find these flying right over the turf and they will be looking uh, to detect grubs. They can detect the odor of the grub. This robust wasp will then dig down into your turf, into the soil and lay her egg on a white grub. So a Japanese beetle or June beetle larvae. And this is a potter wasp. This is another above ground nester. They make these very cool little um, uh, pots out of mud. And you can see here, um, this female is provisioning that nest with inchworm larvae uh, that then her offspring will consume. Now, of course, uh, in addition to those solitary wasps, there are the predatory wasps that make, uh, that are social, that make nests where you have a queen and workers and they raise larvae. Now we think about this with bees, they go out, they pollinate all the plants, they come back, they bring pollen and nectar, they raise offspring. People think that's a good thing for the most part. Here we have a similar thing, although these workers are going out and getting mostly caterpillars, but other kinds of insect prey as well, and bringing them back uh, and raising their offspring. And I know there was a whole talk on wasps, and so I won't go into extreme detail, but just to say that these are providing a pest control benefit, but of course you have to balance that with any safety concern. So depending on where the nest might be, uh, you have to decide if this is something that you want in the landscape or can tolerate safely, or if it's you know, right above where a playground you know, equipment is in your yard or something, maybe that's not the best place for wasp nests. So this is something that people need to consider. There are many different species from the paper wasps, which make these open cavity nests to the yellow jackets and hornets that make these closed paper nests. The nests are made out of a combination of the insects, uh, saliva, water, and tree uh, material. So they will scrape trees to get this, uh, to make this paper, which is very cool. <clears throat> And I had to do a murder hornet slide because I knew someone might ask. So uh, over the last year, we entomologists have received a multitude of emails asking if something is a murder hornet. And most of the time, uh, it is not a murder hornet. It is the European hornet. So the European hornet is found throughout Ohio and much of the US. The Asian hornet has only been detected in a few locations in the Pacific Northwest. So if you are in that area, you do want to be uh, very observant and let folks know if you think you have found one because they are attempting to eradicate this insect. Um, but most of the time when we get pictures, they are of this species. So there are some really great resources you can find online now. Entomologists have put together um, keys, picture keys for people um, so that you can detect what you might have found. So finally, I wanted to talk about spiders. Uh, many people might be fearful of spiders, but spiders are nothing to be fearful about. They don't want to bite you. They want to consume insect pests. 
Many of those things like mosquitoes and uh, moths and things might be pests of your um, fruits, vegetable crops or ornamental plants. And so they're doing you a benefit. They're also beautiful. This is a group of orb weavers. Um, orb weavers usually have one generation per year in the areas where folks are calling in from today. So by the fall is really the time to go out and look for these because they'll be in the adult stage and they'll be big and able to, you'll be able to see them easier. But there are many, many beautiful ones. There are also some uh, interesting spiders to look for on the ground and near water features. So this is a wolf spider. Wolf spiders exhibit a form of parental care, which is really neat. The females will carry their egg sac with them to prevent things from eating it. And when the eggs hatch, they will climb aboard the wolf spider mother and the little spiderlings will ride there until they reach their second instar. So after they've molted and gotten a little bit bigger, they will disperse. This is a fishing spider. She also carries her egg mass, but in her palps instead of attach her abdomen. So she'll pick it up, carry it, and then set it down, hunt, do whatever, grab it, take it to the next location. Sort of like a little stroller. These are really, really big spiders. This is one I get a lot of emails about. People find these things. If you have a backyard pond, you might find one. They're called the fishing spider because they do hunt in semi-aquatic habitats. They will um, put their legs out on uh, water and attempt to fish for their prey. So aquatic insects that are occurring in the pond, they might try to catch those and eat them. They'll also eat insect pests off of plants and things um, emerging from a pond. In some parts of the world, these are huge and they actually can take fish. So some of them are, are very big. And finally, the jumping and crab spiders. Usually if people really don't like spiders, I can at least get them to like crab spiders and jumping spiders because they're very cute. So here is um, a Phidippus. This is a really common jumping spider. Probably some of you have seen the jumping spider Christmas video on Facebook. That's one of my favorite like insect videos. It's really funny. If you haven't seen it, Google that. Um, some uh, crab spiders are um, able to change colors to perfectly camouflage themselves in flowers. So here is a yellow crab spider in a monkey flower. Here's a crab spider uh, that's more of a traditional color. This is another kind of jumping spider called the zebra spider. So these are really uh, kind of neat uh, pattern ones and very common in landscapes, in residential areas. Now, I also wanted to talk about um, parasitoids, which are another type of um, natural enemy or pest uh, insect that provides pest control. So we've talked about many, many predators where they actually go out and hunt themselves. Parasitoids, the females will find prey for their offspring. Uh, so here we have, uh, this is a little graphic showing the life cycle of a parasitoid. So here we have the female adult fly and she will lay eggs on a pest. The eggs will hatch, they will eat the pest, kill it, and then fly off mate, and the fe next females will look for pests again. So here it's the adults that locate food for their offspring. This is called the feather-legged fly, this big picture. This eats squash bug. So if you find these in a cucurbit patch at home, that's a really good sign that you have something eating squash bug. They're in the family Tachinidae. Um, which are a group of flies that all live a parasitoid life cycle like this. There are also parasitoids that attack the striped cucumber beetle. Here is a cocoon of one emerging from a dead cucumber beetle. And this is a tachinid fly that attacks caterpillar pests. So there are, I think, 10,000 species of these in North America, and they each have a very specific host that they look for. So they won't attack just anything. They always want to have one certain kind of host. Same thing with wasps. There are parasitoid wasps that again have very specific hosts. And the look of the parasitoid tells you something about both its host and where that host lives. So in some cases, the parasitoid is huge. So this is a large uh, ichneumonid parasitoid. It is with the, this ovipositor that looks like a stinger a few inches long. People really freak out because they think that it's gonna attack them with the stinger. It cannot sting you. This is an egg laying device. But the reason this thing is so big is it needs to drill into trees to find wood wasps that eat the tree. 
So Cyrix wood wasps are a pest of dead and decaying trees. And when you have trees that have these larvae inside, it will attract these wasps and they can take their ovipositor and go into the tree and lay their egg inside the wood wasp. The larvae will eat it and emerge again. There are also tiny, tiny little parasitoid wasps that are hard to see with the naked eye. This picture was taken under a microscope of this little wasp attacking an aphid. So here in this drawing, we can see that life cycle a little bit better. So first the female lays an egg in the aphid, it stings it with its ovipositor. The larvae eats the aphid, killing it. Then it pupates and emerges from the aphid. Now here is a dead aphid called an aphid mummy. And that has a parasitoid transforming inside. And that adult will eventually chew a little exit hole and come out of the aphid. So if you see a patch of aphids with brown and black aphids mixed in, it means that there are parasitoids in there. Sometimes when you have a big prey, many parasitoids can develop in one host. So here is a hornworm. And you can see that there are all of these little things on top. These are cocoons of a parasitoid a braconid parasitoid that has killed this hornworm. And many uh, larvae were able to develop and all of these will emerge as adults and go find other hornworms and lay eggs. And then again, new populations will emerge. So if you find this uh, on tomatoes or in the garden, you definitely want to leave it there. Okay, so that was our tour of different groups of beneficial predatory insects. Now. What do we do to help these insects at home? So this is pretty basic. Insects need food, shelter, water, and to not be killed by stuff. So if you can do those things, you can provide habitat for them in the landscape. And I want to start, this is the perfect time of year to start off with our lawns. So here is where you want to do no harm. If you are putting herbicides, pesticides, and things like that on your lawn, you are taking out the biggest part of habitat that you can provide for beneficial insects. Most of us have more lawn than we have other features in our, in our home landscape. Not everybody, some people's yard might be mostly gardens, but a lot of people have a lot of lawn. And so if you plant flowers in one area, but then put down a pesticide across the lawn, it's really reducing the value of your landscape overall. And this is particularly important early in the season. Early in the season, pollinating insects and predatory insects are waking up. They've been hibernating all year. They've been inactive. Now it's getting warm and they go to look for food. Well, there isn't a lot of prey available yet. And so early in the season, they need pollen and nectar, not just bees, but all um, predatory insects, mostly all also feed on pollen and nectar. And the first thing they will go and look for are early season blooming flowers. And many insects will find flowers on the ground like dandelions. And so because of this, lots of communities are starting to uh, promote a no mow May, where we allow these weeds to grow during May without mowing our lawn to provide habitat for all of these insects. And this is a picture I took last May, just in one area uh, of the lawn of all the different insects visiting dandelions. Butterflies, here uh, on the bottom, we have a surfid fly. I talked about surfids. This dandelion had like 10 surfids. I couldn't even get it in focus because there are so many. And of course, many species of wild bees as well will feed on dandelions. Now, I know everyone doesn't like dandelions and that's fine. There are a lot of other types of lawn practices you can try um, to provide uh, flowers and maybe more of an aesthetically pleasing look uh, for, for folks. There are many, many different lawn mixes coming out now that are flowering lawns. Um, and even doing reduced mowings or reduced input lawns will still have benefits, uh, even if they don't have flowering resources, because you're not adding in these pesticides and herbicides into the lawn. Now, in terms of adding other plants beyond your lawn, people, this is probably people's biggest question. So there are many different ways that you can enhance your lawn for beneficial insects, or I'm sorry, your landscape um, through planting flowers. But the types of flowers can really vary. So the most important thing is that you want to think about the season from very early, like this time of year, 
to October, November, depending on where you are. Some of you, you know, year round, you're going to have insect activity if you don't have a hard winter, hard frost. So you need to think about providing resources throughout the time frame when insects are active. That means fall and spring blooming species or even winter blooming for those in the south. You also want to provide flowers that vary in color because different colors can attract different insects and different shapes. So inse insects have different kinds of mouth parts and some cannot find nectar if the flower has like a very narrow long tube, like I'm thinking about tobacco flowers, for instance, they have this really long tube and the nectar is way down on the bottom. Well, a butterfly might be able to get its proboscis down in there, but something like a beetle, that's not going to be able to feed on that. So we wanna provide lots of different flower shapes. It's also a lot of fun to experiment with native plants. And as was discussed at the beginning, those are becoming more and more commonly found now. And there are also many annual and perennial options. You don't need to spend a fortune to be able to provide uh, habitat for insects. The only thing that's not going to be um, super great as a resource are plants where they've been hybridized to produce little to no resources. So an example are some hybrid petunias. They don't make a lot of pollen and nectar, if any at all. And so those are not, that's why you never really see any insects really visiting those. It uh, doesn't mean not to use them um, because you know, we also appreciate them aesthetically, but you can do things like mix them with a, with a plant that does provide pollen and nectar. So here is a basket with sweet alyssum, which is incredibly attractive to insects with the petunias. So kind of think about balancing what we want out of our landscape um, visually with also what we want out of our landscape in terms of a habitat. Um, it doesn't have to be one or the other thing. So I'm gonna go through some examples. Uh, if you haven't tried to create a small wildflower garden uh, of native plants for your area, I would highly suggest doing it. This is something that I found to be really kind of fun because the plants are different than you probably are used to growing up. Uh, and I like seeing all these rare um, native plants in my backyard. They're also very attractive and rare, and they can be host plants for a lot of butterflies and other insects. The seeds that they make are also food for birds and other wildlife. So if you leave them up and don't prune them up at the end of their um, bloom period, you'll find birds using them for shelter and food. And it really does make you think so much about, even in the city, my yard can be a habitat. And I live right in Columbus in downtown. And so I don't have a large garden. And I don't really actually know a lot about gardening, despite my name and profession as an entomologist. I know a lot about insects and what they feed on. But when it comes to growing plants, I just kind of put stuff in and see what happens. And so when I moved in, there was just this Japanese maple, um, which I left there because I didn't want to take it out. But then I put all of these native plants around it. Uh, including this ironweed, which is now huge. And so these were found all locally at common garden centers um, that carry both natives and native cultivars. I didn't kill any of these, which is pretty amazing because I have killed a lot of plants. And so I have come to realize that because these are native plants, they're very tolerant of abuse. And so if you're concerned that like, I don't want to get these because it sounds hard, it's actually easier to grow these. You do want to pay attention to what it says on the little tag that comes with it. Like if it says this is 15 feet tall and you think that's insane, no plant is going to be that big. Yes, it is going to be. As you can see in the back picture, I had to move that one because it was so huge. Also, don't forget about trees and shrubs. So right now, shrubs and trees are starting to bloom. They're the only thing blooming in my area anyway. And so that's really important to provide those early season resources. And if you haven't gotten started with this, if you're new to it, the Xerces Society is an outstanding resource to find this information. You can find lists for your area, you can sort by your zip code and find plants that would work well for you. When you go there, you're gonna get overwhelmed with choices because there are so many beautiful and unique plants. And so, as I said, really, there isn't one specific plant. What you want to do is diversify. So get different heights, different colors, different shapes, and experiment. See what grows well in your soil. And then the next year, get more of that one. So get a few to start and then see how things do. Also, within a group of plants, there can be extreme uh, variation in the value of that plant for um, insects. So this is a picture here of dahlias. 
planted in containers. And in the foreground, you can see you have dahlias where you can see the reproductive parts of the flower in the middle. These are often called singles or old varieties or heirlooms. So heirloom roses, heirloom dahlias. You can see here in this, I blew it up here. Um, if you can see the resources, that's gonna be more beneficial to predatory insects that can feed on those resources than plants called doubles or triples. Doubles or triples, the petals are there instead of the resources. So there's really not as much resource for them. And that's what's going on with these yellow ones in the back. And so plants like this include roses and dahlias and hollyhocks and things. And so you wanna go with the older um, varieties, heirloom varieties of these. <clears throat> there are also many plants that produce extra floral nectar. Extra floral nectar is nectar produced outside the flowers. So this might be on the leaves, uh, such as this little patch here of sugary nectar, or here is a wasp feeding uh, on a bract of a flower bud. Uh, these are plants that recruit these beneficial insects to eat pests off them. And the best example, I think, are peonies. The reason that you always see ants on peonies before they bloom is peonies make extra floral nectar and those green petals that cover the flower buds. The ants colonize the peonies. They protect the peonies from pests. So there are many trees and shrubs and crops and annual plants that make extra floral nectar that you can mix into your landscape. And some of these even make little cups for the insects to drink out of, which is super cute. And so I had to include a picture of it. There are also some really attractive annuals that people will incorporate well into vegetable gardens. So these plants might not work super well in all settings, but they work great for attracting in predators to your vegetable crops. Uh, and here I have the sweet seven or seven very attractive herbs and uh, annual plants that can be used uh, in vegetable crop production. And some of these work really well in strips like sweet alyssum can be incorporated into vegetable beds in strips or as a border. So if you have a larger garden and want to do a border of something like fava bean or buckwheat and then till it in uh, at the end of the season, those work better on the outside because they are larger plants. If your backyard is smaller like mine, uh, containers can be a great way to provide these beneficial annuals. Uh, here I would use kind of different annuals, except for alyssum, that kind of works well in either situation. But I highlighted some ideas of things I've managed not to kill uh, in my own container gardening in the past, and that are also very common in gardens. People that are better at this than I am can make very beautiful containers out of these annuals. So again, it's about balancing aesthetic beauty with also providing habitat. We're not doing one or the other, giving up one for the other. We also want to think about where these insects will go after we're done with the garden. After we're sick of weeding in August, the insects still need to live until the next spring. So you want to think about not taking out everything at the end of the season, but instead leaving habitat like leaves, mulch piles, wood piles, stones, cracks and crevices for insects to escape harsh conditions. We also can add shelters like bee houses back into the landscape. There are many different of these available commercially, or you can make your own. You can have small ones up to you know, massive hotels if it's a conservation site or park. Uh, there's even bumblebee houses that are available. I know Denise at one point had bumblebees living in an overturned flower pot and there's actually designs online where you can set up an overturned flower pot with a, a tube that goes down in the soil for bumblebees. But the one thing I would not buy are these boxes for ladybugs and butterflies because they don't go, ladybugs and butterflies don't overwinter in little boxes. They overwinter in leaf material and under stones. And the only thing that will go in these are paper wasps. And then you will look in there to see what's in there and paper wasps will come out. So don't buy those, although they are cute. Um, people ask about fruit feeders. Fruit feeders are great for beneficial insects, but um, make sure you change out the fruit a lot because it will ferment, obviously. And also be aware that you're putting out sugar. And so anything that eats sugar is gonna come. So we can't only want butterflies. We have to understand that other insects 
that are also beneficial like wasps will also visit the sugar. So make sure you set this up where you can enjoy it, um, but not be in a situation where you're fearful of who's there. And water, this is something that I sometimes forget is so important in a residential landscape. We don't know, you know, in a residential landscape, how much water might be around us usually. Like, do my neighbors have water feature? I don't know. Um, and I really noticed this this summer, I think because I was home so much during the day that at my fountain, we had so many bumblebees and honeybees coming by to drink water that I decided to experiment with some other kinds of water features. I put um, some emergent plants in my fountain because I noticed a lot of insects were dying because they were drowning. And then I also put in a small pond that didn't have flowing water so much where they would have more opportunities to drink. And then I still noticed there was some mortality in there too. So I also tried just taking a plant saucer and filling it with pebbles and water. And that worked really well. It was also really fun to watch. We put it on a table under on our patio and you could watch stuff come in and take a drink and take off and you saw beetles and wasps and flies and all kinds of stuff uh, using this. So it would be a great project for kids um, to observe what came to the, to the water source. And my last slide here um, is people will say, okay, this all sounds great. Should I purchase and release insects? And I would say to that, definitely focus on creating habitat for the insects you have rather than spending money buying insects to release. If you have a greenhouse and you have an, a pest outbreak in a greenhouse or some kind of caged environment, then yes, sometimes purchasing insects that are predatory to release makes sense, but you don't wanna release them in the open environment because some of these insects are wild caught. They could have pests or diseases that are, might be novel to the populations we have. They also are likely to not be in the best health after shipment. And they probably will leave. So a lot of these insects um, might be shipped in a dormant stage. And when they come uh, to wake up, they, their instinct is to fly away. So you're helping people in the next town over maybe or the next subdivision and not necessarily your own. So thank you very much uh, for coming today. It was a pleasure to get to share this information with you. I will now answer questions from the chat. And as I mentioned at the beginning, I don't mind getting emails and my email is on the slide if you'd like to send one. Great, Mary, thank you so much. Uh, so many great uh, practical ideas for what we could do in our own landscapes. I know folks appreciate that. And I know your time is limited too. So I'll um, go- I, with I emailed, my, I have a meeting with my student. It's fine. Okay, we can, so you're we okay. We can do some okay. questions. Okay, great. I no kind of grouped the questions. There were lots of questions about uh, non-native mantids versus the native ones and what um, folks should do if they find them. There were some concerns about mantids affecting monarch populations. Maybe you can start there. Yes, so um, I don't, so I guess I'm gonna preface that by saying there are some monarch experts out there and I'm not one of those people, but I do know that there are a lot of predatory insects that will take uh, monarchs, uh, eggs and larvae especially. I don't know much about the role that, man that praying mantises play as a predator of monarchs, so I can't speak specifically to that, unfortunately. If you'd like to email me, I'm more than happy to see if um, I know an, a monarch expert and I can look into her literature and see if there is anything um, about that. I don't um, do anything to manage mantids. Uh, I haven't ever read anything about them being um, a detriment to any biodiversity that is threatened before. And so I, I don't know that that is a, a major issue. Great, thanks. Um, so there was a question about the oleander the aphids on milkweed. Um, and you know, we all know that orange, if we try to take them off with our hands, we get stained. Um, who's eating those? Why aren't more predators eating those? So a lot of predators love to eat aphids, but they don't like to eat those aphids. And the reason is, is because milkweed has secondary plant chemicals that those aphids take up and it makes them extremely distasteful. And so they have a protection from other insects. I've had milkweed that is completely covered with those and the, the, the milkweed can take a large amount of aphid feeding damage. But I've also read that monarch larvae prefer new leaf tissue. And my PhD advisor actually did an experiment with this where he cut back the milkweed mid-season and allowed it to regrow. And he found more larvae being laid on those new growths. And so what I do with my own milkweed is when um, 
it gets kind of woody, kind of mid-season and full of aphids. I'll cut it back pretty severely and take that material out. And so there's a few aphids still, but I've really knocked down the population and allow it to regrow. And it takes quite a while for the aphids to build back up. And sometimes I've cut it multiple times. It will also flower again if you do that, um, especially swamp milkweed. Sorry, I had to find my mute button. <laughs> um, so you gave some suggestions for how to attract um, uh, beneficials in general, but how about specifically to attract native lady beetles versus uh, non-native? Are there any, any tricks there? Well, so uh, we've done an extensive project on backyard gardens and native ladybugs. And I will say, A, native ladybugs live in backyard gardens, not just backyard, but like home gardens. They use that habitat. So having a backyard, front yard, garden, providing flowers that any insect can access, like that open flower that someone's using for their uh, picture on the screen right now, that's the most important thing that you can do is provide habitat because we know that exotic and native ladybugs compete for habitat. So the more habitat we provide, the better off the native species will be. They have a very strong niche overlap, meaning they have very similar needs and they use very similar habitats to the alien species. That's why they've really declined. And so unfortunately there isn't like something you can do to partition and uh, just have the natives. Another thing we found though, is natives have a strong need to have forest patches. And so if you are someone who lives in an area with bigger landscape elements that you own, maintaining forest patches is also very important. That's good to know. I know I always mentioned uh, forest remnants with um, Karen Goodell and her work out at the wilds where she talked about native bees nesting in those um, those little forest patches on that reclaimed strip mine and that even, you know, your little patch of forest in your backyard or at a, a school or a community park can really do a lot as far as adding to that habitat. So we all need to buy more trees. Right. And what these guys are doing is they'll fly to the forest patches to overwinter and they burrow down and they nest over the winter at the bases of the trees. And so it can be, like you said, Denise, a small patch, but they need that patch of trees. Awesome. So uh, Erica's questions, she said, you have, be you have said the beetles are an important ecological indicator, but what do they indicate? And then um, Denise asks, is there a way to get more ground beetles to inoculate your yard with them or how do we bring in more? Okay, so in terms of indicator, great question. I didn't, I flew through that part and didn't explain. So I could give a whole seminar about ground beetles as ecological indicators. And that actually might be a fun thing to do in the future, Denise, we'll have to think about that. But um, so ecological indicator means that the characteristics of an ecosystem can be measured based on the fauna that you collect. So in, for instance, there are certain ground beetles that are only found in very moist environments. There are certain ground beetles that are only found in very pristine habitats where we, we don't have a lot of disturbance. There are other species that are very tolerant of pollution and, de and habitat degradation. And when you go to an environment and you collect the beetle fauna that's there and you mostly see really specialist beetles that only feed on particular prey and there's a lot of habitat specialists that only like moist environments or dry environments, and things, it tends to paint a picture of that that habitat is pretty intact and in good quality. And then if you go to another site and you find mostly generalists and things that are able to tolerate pollution and things that eat weed seeds and other signs of habitat disturbance, that tells you that that ecosystem is not very healthy, that it, it does not have a lot of beetle fauna that needs specific requirements. And so when we're doing habitat restoration, what a lot of people will do is They'll make changes to try to improve habitat quality and they'll resample and they'll say, okay, now I've done this for five years. Do I have different ground beetle species here than I did when I started? Am I seeing indication that my habitat quality is improving? It's very similar if you're familiar with stream ecology at all. People do the same thing with the kinds of insects that live in streams. You can gauge a stream quality by the caddis flies and the mayflies and the dragonfly larvae that are there. There are certain species that indicate high quality and ones that indicate low quality. And so the follow-up piece then was, can how do we encourage those ground beetles? Beetle banks or you know, other recommendations that you might have? So there's, it depends on the scale. So in an agricultural field, you lose a lot of ground beetles because of things like tillage and habitat dis 
you know, soil disturbance because they are on the soil. So as Denise mentioned, something like a beetle bank or a wildflower border um, or just an unmown border will often be used to try to build up populations and encourage them into the, the agricultural field. In a residential habitat, like a yard, uh, reducing pesticide use, reducing herbicides, um, and also in your beds, uh, reduced tillage is going to aid the ground beetles. So no-till gardening, reduced till gardening, also adding amendments like mulch, leaf litter, things like that, that provide soil structure and also protect the beetles from the sun. A lot of insects can desiccate. And so if we just have open soil everywhere, it can be bad for them. Now, open soil is important for bees, some bee species. So it's important to have a lot of different habitats available in your landscape. The more unique habitats you offer at a micro scale, the more different types of insects might find and colonize those. So take out more of that lawn and uh, uh, develop these diverse uh, elements in our landscapes. Now, somebody, can I, I just saw a really important comment go by. Oh, can I, is it all right if I? Absolutely. Okay, so somebody said, one of the biggest problems I have with natives is that other people want them to look neat and clean. And I 100% get that. And in fact, this has been one of the biggest struggles we've had with our vacant lot project is that while some people love it, I also received a lot of negative feedback on the look of the plants. And so um, Denise and I are actually putting together for next year, and I, I think we'll probably do some webinars like this, a garden strategy where we're trying to balance aesthetics with habitat quality and provide more options for native cultivars where maybe instead of being 15 feet tall, it's the same resources in a more compact plant or other things that you might incorporate in areas where you want to have a public facing garden that is more universally accepted or maybe is pushing people towards more of a native aesthetic without going like full in with a more messy natural look. And in my yard, for instance, I'm in an HOA, so the front yard has to be kind of kept up and then I have all my native stuff in the back. So yes, having more um, resources that I might put in my front is something that I think about a lot. And I'll put in, we uh, one of the examples that uh, Mary and I really enjoy is uh, the Plant by Numbers project from the Lexington Parks in Kentucky. And I'll try to put that link in the chat box. They have some nice, simple, small, you know, around the mailbox, uh, small little sidewalk plantings with native plants. And uh, just a really nice tool, a little handout, like, here you go. You don't know how to dive in with natives. Here's a good uh, place to start. Denise, someone has a great name for our project, Mullet Gardens. Business in the front, party in the back. <laughs> we don't have to grow mullets to do that, do we? <laughs> After the, the pandemic, I don't know what's going on with my hair, but hear we definitely uh, will consider that idea. But yes, you guys should check out. We were totally inspired by the Lexington, Lexington Gardens project and are really excited about that. So Mary, who eats uh, crunchy beetles? There were questions about Japanese beetles, viburnum leaf beetles, cur uh, plum curculio. Um, who's helping us out with those big crunchy beetles or does nobody want them? Well, not a lot of people, not a lot of people, not a lot of insects want to eat the adults of those. They're very big and like you said, very <clears throat> sclerotized, but there are a few things that eat the larvae. So um, the, uh, flower wasps that I mentioned will eat the larvae of Japanese beetles. There are also nematodes or wor um, there are worms, predatory worms that can live in soil and they will eat Japanese beetle larvae. So <clears throat> from what I know and bacteria as well that you can um, actually inoculate your soil with to kill the larvae. From what I know, it's most um, frequently the larvae that are preyed upon. The adults, I tend to try to just trap or hand remove, which is a pain, but. There was a question about um, cicada killer wasps and them being kind of a pest as far as digging up the, the garden area. Um, any way to encourage them in some areas or discourage them in others? They're kind of like um, wood boring bees. Once they find their jam, they're just gonna keep going for it. So you must have like the ideal soil, but here's a party trick that you might do. So when you see a bunch of them all clustered together, it's males and they fight with each other to attract the females. So 
if you want to scare your guests, you can pick up like a giant ball of them fighting and the males can't sting. But if you mess up and grab a female, that's not a great situation. So but Mary, I have done this and it is hilarious. I think we're all going to have social anxiety anyway after being closed up in right. our Zoom rooms. And so I just want to be around people, not scare them away. <laughs> well, when we finally gather together. I'm awkward enough that I would probably think that that would be impressive and might try it. So yeah, I probably need to stay in my Zoom room. <laughs> Well, can you, um, can you wrap up by, uh, do you have any suggestions for apps or websites? Uh, of course, your book is a wonderful reference uh, for identification and uh, that natural history information, but do you have any online sorts, uh, sources or apps that can help with ID? Well, the first thing that I would do for ID is if you find an insect that you don't know what it is, I would submit it to iNaturalist and bugguide.net. Bugguide.net is kind of a clunky looking website, but if you submit a picture, everything I've ever submitted that's like weird things I can't identify, some expert will identify it within a couple of days. And iNaturalist also things will get sorted by experts and identified. And also those websites are used by scientists to do all sorts of projects like identifying new species, looking at ranges of species, looking at declines. And so when you provide data like that for ID, not only does it help you, but it really helps us to have more access to more data. Great, thanks. And um, yesterday, Olivia talked about GBIF or some, sometime this week, we mentioned GBIF and that's a big database and all of the iNaturalist data feeds into that wider database. So it really is information that researchers like Mary and others are, are using out in the, in the field and in the lab. I actually just cited GBIF in our, I'm writing a review article about citizen science and its value in entomology. And there's something like 160 million insect records in that database provided by volunteers. Wow, that's so awesome. pretty impressive. Awesome. Well, folks, thank you so much for, uh, for coming today. Mary, thanks for a great program. It's always, I always learn so much. You have such a great style of uh, really transferring all of your knowledge into a way that's accessible for folks. So um, lots of good uh, uh, thank yous in the chat box. Um, if you came all week for the webinar series, thanks so much. All those recordings will be up. We were so glad to see you. And we'll be putting together, plotting and planning some um, webinars for the future. So we'll be back in this room at some point. Uh, in the meantime, get out and enjoy spring. Thank you so much. And thanks to all of you. Those comments mean a whole lot to me. I'm really glad that so many of you enjoyed the presentation. And thanks, Denise. I, this was great. I hope we can do this again soon. Thanks all.